Hello students, welcome back to another online lecture of the online lecture series initiated by Shet Vidya Mandir English High School and Junior College of Science and Commerce, Vasai. I am Mrs. Nehal Falkau. Students, today's video lecture is a continuation of my previous video lecture where we have studied the summary of the novel To Serve With Love which is chapter number 4.2 of section 4 of your English course book. Students, in my previous video, I have already told you that your 12th standard syllabus does not prescribe the study of the entire novel simply because the novel is a big fat book and it is not possible to study the entire novel in just a few days. So, we are going to study only chapter number 17 of the novel To Sir With Love. Before we begin, let me remind you that this novel is an autobiographical piece of writing where the novelist E. R. Braithwaite recounts his personal experiences. So, let us begin. To Sir With Love Chapter 17 The half-yearly report of the Students' Council was on November 15th and was one of the important days in the calendar of Greenslade School. I had heard quite a deal about these occasions and became as excited as the students as the day approached. It was entirely their day arranged, presented and controlled by them. I observed the activities of my class as they prepared for it, noting with pride the business-like way in which tasks were allocated and fitted into a neat program. There were whispered conferences with members of other classes in the arrangement of it. On that day, there was no assembly. The children arrived smartly dressed and polished and Miss Joseph and Denham, who seemed to be the important officials for the occasion, moved about among their colleagues, ensuring that each one was ready to play his or her part. Students, today I am going to explain each paragraph in detail. In chapter number 17, Braithwaite recounts the half-yearly report of the Students' Council in which the students of the school report to the faculty members and other students on what they have been studying thus far. It was November 15 and it was the most important day in the history of Greenslade School. It was the day when the Students' Council had to present the half-yearly report on what they have learned so far. They had to do this in front of their teachers as well as other students. The narrator, E. R. Braithwaite, being new to the school, was very excited about this day. He had heard a great deal about this day and was as excited as the students were. But this day belonged completely to the students as they organized everything, presented the report and controlled everything on their own. On that day, Braithwaite observed how students of his class prepared for this big day. He was proud to see how his students allocated, that is, distributed the tasks among themselves and how 
the tasks were organized into a neat program. It seems his students arranged conferences with the students of other classes also. That big day finally arrived. There was no assembly on that day. All the children came smartly dressed. Two students, Miss Joseph and Master Denham, who were the most important students of that day's occasion, were seen moving about around the students, making sure they were well prepared to play their assigned part for the day. A bell was rung at 10 a.m. and everyone trooped into the auditorium to sit together in classes. Miss Joseph and Denham, the two most senior students, sat on the stage, one on each side of Mr. Florian, who, as soon as everyone was seated and silent, stood and addressed the school. He spoke at length, reiterating the aims and policy of the school and of the important contribution each child could make to the furtherance of those aims. He gave praise wherever it was indicated, but insisted that there was yet a great deal to be done by themselves towards a general improvement in conduct, cleanliness and the pursuit of knowledge. As I listened, I realized that this man was in no way remote from his school. His remarks all showed that he identified himself with it and everyone in it. He then wished them success with the council meeting and left the stage to tremendous applause. In the second paragraph, we are told the bell rang at 10 a.m. and it all began. All the students gathered in the auditorium and sat according to their classes. The two most senior students, Miss Joseph and Master Denham, went to sit up on the stage with Mr. Florian, the headmaster, sitting in between both of them. Mr. Florian addresses the meeting with a lengthy speech, reiterating, that is, stating the aims and policy of the school and pointing out to the students how important the contribution of each student matters. He even praised them wherever necessary and reminded them that still they have to work all by themselves towards improvement in their conduct, that is, their behavior, and cleanliness and the pursuit, that is, search of knowledge. As Braithwaite listened to his speech, he realized that Mr. Florian identified himself with the school and the students, and he was truly a part of the school. Concluding his speech, he wished the students success for that day's presentation and left the stage as the students gave a huge round of applause. Things now moved quickly into gear. First, Miss Joseph stood up and gave a short explanation of the council's purpose and its activities. Each class would report through its representatives on the studies pursued during the half year which began after Easter, a representative having been chosen for each subject. When all the classes had completed their reports, a panel of teachers would be invited to occupy the stage and answer questions from the body of the hall on matters arising out of various reports. The selection of the panel, as with everything else, was entirely at the discretion of the children and 
no members of the staff knew either how many or which teachers would be invited to sit the presentation now began miss joseph gave a short explanation about the students council purpose and the activities it carries out each class had appointed its representative for each subject and that representative would present before the teachers and other students a report on what they have studied during half year that began after easter all the panel had to present their report after which they would invite a panel of teachers who would answer questions from the body of hall on matters arising out of various reports everything about the presentation including the selection of the panel was totally at the discretion of the students discretion means the freedom to decide what should be done in a particular situation none of the teachers had any idea how many teachers or which teachers would be selected on the panel all of this was to be decided by the students themselves the reports began with the lowest or youngest class first these were mainly 12 year olds who had joined the school the previous summer most of them were shy and rather frightened at standing up before the entire school but nevertheless they managed it creditably they had been newly introduced to the difficulties of seeking information for themselves so their report was understandably rather short class of the class was represented and it was obvious that with each succeeding term there was a marked development in their ability to express themselves much of the work was rather elementary but to them it loomed large because they understood it and something of its relationship to themselves throughout all the reports the emphasis was on what they understood rather than on what they were expected to learn in this paragraph we are told that the presentation began first with the lower classes the students from the lower classes were mainly 12 year old students who had just joined school most of these newcomers were shy and also had a stage fright that is they were frightened to stand and speak in front of the entire school but still they managed it so well that it deserved credit and praise however the report they presented was rather short because being newcomers they found it difficult to gather information following the newcomers other representatives began presenting their reports of their respective class which showed that with each succeeding term they were showing development in their ability to express themselves much of their work was elementary that is easy and not involving much complications but for the students it was a big deal because they understood every bit of it and how it affected them what was important was what they understood rather than what the teachers expected them to learn when the turn of my class came i sat up anxiously from the list he held in his hand then him called out the names of the representatives together with the subjects on which they would report potter arithmetic say piano 
नेचर स्टडी मिस पेग एंड जैक्सन जोग्राफी मिस डेर एंड फोनमेन फिजियोलॉजी मिस डॉड हिस्ट्री डेनहम पी टी एंड गेम्स एंड मिस जोजफ डोमेस्टिक साइंस आई फील टेरिबली प्लीज एंड प्राउड टू सी द कॉन्फिडेंट कर्टसी विथ विच डेनहम यूज द टर्म मिस इन एड्रेसिंग ईच ऑफ द सीनियर गर्ल्स I felt sure that this would in itself be something for the younger ones to aim at a sort of a badge of young adulthood as their names were called they walked up to the stage and took their seats with commendable gravity in this paragraph we are told that it was now the turn of Braithwaite's class He was very anxious that is nervous as to how his class would perform then him held a list in his hand and from that list he called out the names of the representatives and the subjects on which they would report Potter would report on arithmetic that is mathematics Sapiano would report on nature study Miss Peg and Jackson on geography, Miss Dare and Fonman on physiology, Miss Dodd on history and Master Denham on PT and games and Miss Joseph would report on domestic science. Braithwaite was extremely happy and proud to see how politely Denham addressed all senior girls as Miss This was something Braithwaite had taught them. This was something the younger students could learn from their seniors. As their names were called out, the students walked up to the stage to take their seats. Miss Joseph then gave a short address. She said that their lessons had a particular bias towards the brotherhood of mankind and that they had been learning through each subject how all mankind was interdependent in spite of geographical location and differences in color races and creed it began with miss joseph she spoke about what she had learned in her class about the brotherhood of mankind each subject gave an important lesson on how all mankind depended on each other in spite of the place where they live that is their geographical location and the differences in our skin color race and creed creed means any system of beliefs Then she called on Potter. Potter went on to speak of the work they had done on weights and measures, of the relationship between the kilogram and the pound, the meter and the foot. He said that throughout the world, one or other of those two methods was either in use or understood, and that it was a symbol of the greater understanding. which was being accomplished between poles the next one to report was potter potter told the audience about what they had learned about weights and measurements about the relationship between kilogram and pound the meter and foot he told that the entire world used one of those two methods for measurements Sapiano spoke of the study the class had made of pests especially black rot on wheat boll weevil on cotton and the colorado beetle on potatoes he showed how many countries had pooled their knowledge and the results of research on the behavior breeding habits and migration of these pests and were gradually reducing the threat 
they represented to these important products. Sepiano told about the study they made about pests, especially the black rot on wheat plant, ball weevil on cotton, and the Colorado beetle on potatoes. He showed how many countries had pooled, that is, combined their knowledge and results of research on how these pests behave, how their breeding habits were, and how they migrate. He also spoke about how these pests were gradually reducing the threat or danger that they posed to these important products. Miss Pegg and Jackson divided the report on geography between them. Jackson spoke about the distribution of mineral deposits and vegetable produce over the earth's surface, how a rich country in one was often deficient in the other, and of the interchange and interdependence which inevitably followed. Miss Pegg dealt with human relationships, stressing the problems facing the post-war world for feeding, clothing and housing its populations. She also made a reference to the thousands of refugees, stateless and unwanted, and to the efforts and programs of the UNICEF. Miss Pegg and Jackson divided the report on geography between them. Jackson spoke first. He spoke about how the mineral deposits and vegetable produce was distributed over the earth's surface. He also spoke about how a country which was rich in one of the mineral deposits or vegetable produce was many a times deficient in the other and thus different countries of the world had to resort to exchange and depend on each other. Miss Pegg spoke about human relations. She stressed the problems faced by the world in the post-war period which included the problems of food, clothing and shelter. She also mentioned the refugees. Refugees are people who are stateless and unwanted and who flee for safety. She also spoke about the efforts made and the programs conducted by the UNICEF in this regard. UNICEF is an agency of the United Nations. Fondman, as usual, had a trump card up his sleeve. When called, he made a signal to someone off stage, and Welsh and Allison appeared bearing a skeleton between them, together with a sort of gallows. When this arrangement had been set up, there was the skeleton hanging from a hook screwed into the top of its skull gently revolving at the end of a cord. This was somewhat in nature of comic relief and the school showed its approval by laughing uproariously. But levity soon evaporated when Fernman began to speak. His voice was clear and precise and he had a strong sense of the dramatic. Calmly, he told them, that it was a female skeleton. That was a fact and could easily be proved. But he could not say with any assurance whether she had been Chinese or French or German or Greek. Nor could he say if she had been brown or white or a mixture of both. And from that he said the class had concluded that basically all the people were the same. The trimmings might be different, but the foundations were laid out according to the same blueprint. Fernman was wonderful. He had them eating out of his hand. Fernman, as usual, had an upper hand over others. He made a signal and 
two of his classmates, Welsh and Alison, came with a skeleton with them. They made the arrangements and set up a skeleton hanging from a hook which was screwed into its skull and the skeleton was gently revolving at the end of a cord. This looked kind of funny and the audience laughed out loud. But when fawn men started speaking, soon levity evaporated. Levity means a manner lacking seriousness. He told the class that it was a female skeleton and this fact could be easily proved. But he could not be sure if that female had been Chinese or French or German or Greek. Also, he could not tell with surety if she had been a brown woman or a white one or a mixture of both. From this example, he wanted to state that basically all people are the same. Their trimmings, that is decoration or making, might be different, but the blueprint from which the foundations were laid was the same. Fernman, as usual, proved to be wonderful. He had them eating out of his hand. Eating out of the hand means to do exactly what someone says or to be completely obedient to someone. Miss Dare's contribution was something of an anticlimax after Foreman's performance and she seemed to realize it. She spoke about the problems which all humanity has to face in terms of sickness and disease and of the advantages gained by the interchange of knowledge, advice and assistance. After Foreman's performance, Miss Dare realized that her contribution was something of an anticlimax, that is, it declined in its importance. She told the audience about human problems related to sickness and disease and she also spoke about the advantages gained by the exchange of knowledge, advice and assistance. Miss Dodd reported on the period of history the class had studied, the Reformation in England. She told of the struggles of men of independent spirit against clerical domination and of the efforts to break from established religious traditions. From those early beginnings gradually grew the idea of tolerance for beliefs and cultures of others. And now the common interest in trying to study and understand those cultures. Miss Dodd spoke about a chapter that they had studied in their history period, which was the Reformation of England. She told the audience about the clerical domination, that is, the domination from the highest members of the church prevalent during that time and how men of independent spirit struggled against them and how they made efforts to break free from the then existing religious traditions. From here gradually grew the idea that we should have tolerance for the beliefs and cultures of other people. This led to the now existing common interest in trying to study and understand different cultures. Denham's report was a bit of a shock. He severely criticized the general pattern of PT and games, emphasizing the serious limitations of space obtaining and the effect of that limitation on their games activities. He complained that the PT was ill-conceived and pointless and the routine monotonous. He could see no advantage in doing it. A jolly good game was far better. Apparently, he was voicing the opinions of all the boys for they cheered him loudly. Denham's report came as shocking for others. 
he heavily criticized the general pattern of PT and games held in the school. He emphasized that the school lacked space for PT and games and how it affected their games activities. According to him, PT was ill-conceived, that is, poorly thought of, and it was pointless in doing PT. He also complained about the monotonous routine, that is, according to him, the routine, that is, the PT exercises they did were repetitive and lacked variety, which made it boring. He said that he couldn't see any advantage in doing PT. Instead, they should have a jolly good game. It appeared that he was just voicing the opinion on behalf of all the boys in the school, for they were cheering him loudly. When the reports were over, Denham called two children at random from the audience and asked them to write the name of each teacher, including the head, on a slip of paper. These slips were folded and placed in a hat, juggled vigorously and then withdrawn one by one. The names were called Mr. Weston, Mr. Dale Evans, Miss Phillips, Denham and Miss Joseph led the others off the stage and the teachers took their seats. Weston big and bushily, untidily, untidy between the two women. Then the questioning began. I believe I would have gone a long way to see what followed. It was an experience which I shall not easily forget. The questions were mostly from the top two classes, probably because the young children were either too timid or too uninformed to formulate their questions. The teachers had no briefing and were often caught out stammering in their indecision. The reports were finally over. Denham called two children at random from the audience. As instructed by Denham, they wrote the names of each teacher, including the head, on a slip of paper. These slips were folded and placed in a hat, juggled vigorously, that is, in a vigorous or powerful manner. These slips were withdrawn one by one. The names of the teachers were called out. Mr. Weston, Mrs. Dale Evans and Miss Phillips. Denham and Miss Joseph led the others off the stage, that is, those students who were sitting up on the stage earlier. And the teachers came up on the stage and took their seats. Mr. Weston sat between the two women. Then the questioning began. The questions were mostly from the two top classes. Probably because the students from the younger classes were either too timid or shy to ask questions or they might be too uninformed to formulate their questions. That is, they didn't know exactly what and how to ask. The teachers had no previous briefing on how it all needs to go about and so the teachers often stammered while giving out their decisions. But here again, I received a big surprise. The frilly, seemingly brainless Miss Euphemia Phillips proved to be the coolest and the best informed of the three. She dealt with the questions put to her with candor and authority and would often intervene skillfully to assist one of the others without causing embarrassment. Weston cut a very ridiculous figure. In the face of Denham's blunt criticisms and Fonman's adroit questioning, he found himself completely nonplussed and tried to bluster his way out with a show of offended dignity. He could not effectively support the PT exercises for which he was partly responsible as having any definite physical advantage. Denham was a trained boxer and insisted that such exercises were only advantageous if practiced daily and for more sustained periods. 
PT twice weekly for 20 minutes was a waste of time, he asserted. Here again, Braithwaite was surprised. The frilly-looking Miss Euphemia Phillips, who seemed brainless, proved to be the coolest and was the best informed among the three teachers sitting up on the stage. She dealt with the questions put to her with authority and candor, that is, the quality of being honest and straightforward. She would also many a times intervene, that it, that is, get involved skillfully to help the other teachers without causing embarrassment. Western seemed to be a very ridiculous figure. Denham's blunt criticisms and Foreman's adroit questioning, that is, skillful questioning, made him completely nonplussed, that is, confused. And he tried to escape his way out by showing offended dignity. He was partly responsible for the PT exercises, but yet he was unable to effectively support the PT exercises and couldn't prove that PT has any definite physical advantage. Denham was a trained boxer and he insisted that such exercises were helpful only if practiced on a daily basis and required more number of periods. He strongly asserted that PT twice weekly for 20 minutes was a total waste of time. Once again, Miss Phillips took the reins and her shock and her stock promptly shot up a hundredfold. She reminded the school that every subject, including PT and games, had been carefully considered and fitted into the teaching timetable so that each student received maximum benefit from it. The students with its limited facilities must be considered in terms of the greatest good for the greatest number and it would be beyond anyone's powers to please everybody. Some of you, she concluded, fixing Denham with innocent eyes, are fortunate in your own fine physical development and do not really need the few meager helpings of PT and games which this school can offer. Try to remember that there are others for whom our program is ideally suited. It may be that some of you Older boys might even be able to help in that respect. Once again, Miss Phillips got involved to save Mr. Weston. She reminded the audience that each subject in the school curriculum, including PT and games, had been carefully considered and perfectly fitted into the teaching timetable to make sure each student received maximum benefit from it. She reminded everyone that for the school which had limited facilities, it is not possible to please everybody. Fixing her eyes on Denham, she concluded that some of you are fortunate that is lucky to have a fine physical development and so do not really need the little help which this school can offer in terms of PT and games. So try to remember that the program the school offers is ideally suited for many others. It would be better if some of the older boys might even be able to help in that respect. Denham was not to be put off by these sugary remarks and rose in reply. Then why do we have to do PT? Why don't they take only the kids who need it? The rest of us can have a game of football or something instead of doing a lot of daft things that's no good to us. This was a poser, but she came right back at him. Her baby blue eyes twinkling in her delight at this crossing of stairs. Let's say it is as much of an exercise of the mind as it is of the body, Denham. The whole timetable in the school is meant to help you in the world after you leave from here and doing what you are told in spite of not liking it is a part of the training. I feel sure that you will see 
the point in that. Denham was not at all offended by these sugary remarks made by Miss Phillips and he decided to reply. He asked Miss Phillips if such was the case then why do they have to do PT? Why don't they take the kids who need it? Instead of doing things that were not at all good or helpful to them, the rest of them could play football or something. This was a poser means this was a question that was difficult to answer. But Miss Phillips answered it rightly, addressing Denham particularly. She said that PT was as much as an exercise of the mind as it was of the body. She reminded him that the whole timetable of that school was meant to help him and others in the world after they left from here. And it is basically a part of the training when someone does something that they are told to do in spite of not at all liking it. She felt sure that Denham would certainly find a point in that. That stopped poor Denham. He knew that he had been outwitted, but he could do nothing about it and sat looking rather rueful, while Miss Phillips' smile broadened. This frilly, innocent-looking pus had gobbled her canary without leaving the tiniest feather. I began to understand how it was that so slight a creature could cope so effectively with her class. Soon after this, as the morning ended, the head went on to the stage and closed the proceedings, expressing his pride in all the children and his deep appreciation of their efforts. The answer that came from Miss Phillips stopped Denham from asking any more questions. Poor Denham knew that he had been outwitted, that is, he was beat with cleverness and wit, but he could not do anything about it. And he sat looking rather rueful, that is, feeling mournful or apologetic. Miss Phillips had a broad smile on her face. She looked like a frilly, innocent-looking cat who had gobbled, that is, eaten up her canary bird without even leaving the tiniest feather. Braithwaite was surprised how Miss Phillips, who was so slight a creature, could cope that is deal so effectively with her class. Soon after this, as the morning ended, the head of the school went on to the stage and closed the proceedings. He said that he was proud of his students and he deeply appreciated the efforts that they put in. That's all from today's video. Today we, had cover, we have covered up chapter 17. That is the entire chapter 4.2 of your English course book. Thank you.